Good morning. Welcome to Kingsway Christian Church. My name is Trevor. I'm one of the pastors. I want to take a moment and just welcome you. So glad you are here. It's summer. Yeah. I know there's so much going on, so many schedules, so much craziness, and you chose to be here, and that is awesome. I hope you can take a rest today and just enjoy the service. If you are new with us, if it's your first time, or if maybe it's your second time, we have a little card in our bulletin. It's a connections card. We have a booth back here. Where they in, uh, the in right? There they are. Yeah. And they would love to get that card from you. If you'd fill that out and take it to them, we can get you connected here as quickly and as seamlessly as possible. Hey, if you would stand up right now with me, though. And pick your favorite person that's sitting around you and greet them and say good morning. And then pick the person you didn't choose and say good morning to them. It's good to be here this morning as we come to celebrate our God and we come to sing to Him, sing about Him. We come to give Him all the glory and praise that is due His name. So would you sing this with me? Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Tight in our trust, the sweetest frame, but holy lean on Jesus' name. And on Christ the solid rock I stand, all the love around me.
that holds the only true foundation that we can build our life on and come before you the sustainer Lord the life to give and we worship you Lord would you give us an awareness of your presence in this place today and remind us who you are remind us what you are doing
God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God, say one more time. And our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God. yourself that we are in the presence of God in this place. Wherever we go, we stand here before Him. As we sing about how great our God is, how He is a strong foundation, how He will sustain He is faithful. And just lift up your own prayer of thanksgiving for His faithfulness, how He has proven that. Maybe this last week, maybe even this morning, maybe over this last year.
esperando Un fin me hice And there I find you in the mystery In oceans deep My faith will stand Oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. For I am yours, you are mine. Grace abounds in deepest water.
allow us to trust that you are who you say you are. That you'll do what you say you will do. To trust your faithfulness. It was so apparent in the past, but it's lost in the present. Lord, because you do not change. And Lord, your love does not grow weaker. Lord, as we continue to encounter your gospel message, would you allow it to come alive to us? And may it not just leave us just knowing. Lord, help us not be able to help but respond to take your gospel outside of these walls, outside of uh, just a discussion. Let it truly have hands and feet. Lord, that we might come and trust that you are who you say you are. We might trust your faithfulness and live accordingly that our life, that our life might be characterized by our trust and our faith in you. Lord, in your name we pray and we sing. Amen. You may be seated. continuing our series Acts today and uh, we are in chapter 2. If you have your Bibles you can go ahead and turn there. We're going to get there in just a moment. Acts chapter 2 verses 42 through 47. Uh, there's a couple ways if you don't have your Bible you can follow along today. It's the old school version. A little paper thing in your bulletin. has uh, all my notes or at least uh, some of my notes, the main points. And then if you want to jump on your phone, which I don't have my with me right now, the version app is an amazing way that you can just tap into what we're talking about, you type in new version, you go to live events, type in our zip code 65712, and boom, it'll pop right up there, and you can see all the scriptures that I'm using, see my notes, and follow along. It's, it's an amazing tool that you have access to. Well, this series has been amazing. We really have been trying to dive into uh, just a lot of stuff, really using the book of Acts to kind of give us this incredible lens to see the beginnings of the church and really see it launch out and to see what really church is. And we've been kind of asking this overarching question that it kind of flows through everything that we're doing, but at the same time, we kind of pop in and out of it. and We kind of see how it, it reveals itself in the scriptures. We see how the scriptures itself is, is, is honed in on this all the time. It's in speaking to this. And we're really asking the question, what is church? And we're using the book of Acts to kind of give us some definitions, give us some terms, give us some things that we should be doing. Because if we truly are the church, what does the church look like? And we're trying to use the first church, the start of the church, as our kind of our reference point. So as we continue the discussion, I want to kind of remind you of this framework, just this statement that we keep saying over and over and over again. And it's a simple statement, but it's something that I hope that just if anybody ever asks you, like, what exactly is church? You would have this at least in your mind. And it would be something that you could at least spit out. And even if you don't completely get it yet, or maybe you've missed a few weeks and you go back and look at it, I want you to at least know this statement. What is church? And this is the framework. It is this. It is a movement of people on mission. It is a movement of people on mission. And that kind of defines that we, as the church, as call ourselves followers of Christ, we are moving towards a mission. We are moving towards a mission, and that is the church. That is the force that, that Jesus himself said that will not be conquered, that will endure, that will defeat. And it is exciting to have that definition so simple, and I hope that you can use that and take that. And Obviously, there's way more to it, and that's why we continue to have this discussion, but it's so nice to have that framework to see how everything that we're going to discuss and talk about kind of fits inside of that and really is something to just kind of key in on. So we're going to look at... Chapter 2, verses 42 through 47 today, and I must tell you that last week I, I preached this uh, message on the first kind of section of this chapter, and it's this huge uh, sermon that basically Peter gave, and it's the gospel. And I kind of walked through the scriptures, and we kind of discussed it, but then I kind of presented in, in some short way, I tried to not take away from what Peter said, because Peter's message is incredibly deep and incredibly powerful, and it's one of those things that it's just, it led to 3,000 people being 
led to Christ in one day, in one message, and more and more as he pleaded. And I just tried to share my heart. And one of the ways that I could see the gospel is becoming stale, and it's just not. And so if you want to go back and check that out, I highly encourage you to do that. Just to remind yourself that we all have big sin in our life, but there's bigger love chasing after us that is putting us on a big mission for the world. And that is the gospel in a nutshell. And we do not grow out of the need for the gospel, yet we grow into a deeper understanding of it. We grow into a deeper need for it. A deeper understanding of the gospel that grows each and one of us. If we have, we have been called to be a Christian, we see that the gospel is not a one-time thing. It's an everyday, every moment thing where we see where we fall short. We see God's love. We see the incredible things that God has planned for us to do and the calling that He has in our life. And that is the gospel. Well, this section of Scripture comes right after that. And it's really important to remind yourself that this is what happens when 3,000 people get saved in one day. Uh, how many of you guys have ever been to uh, the first day of school at a kindergarten or a first grade place? You ever seen this? Okay, it is berserk. You can go home and YouTube it. But if you get to a, a large school and you see the first day of kindergarten, these buses or parents are dropping all these children off, and it looks like a herd of cats with giant backpacks on. I mean, they're just like, woo, where are we going? We're going this way? Okay, where's my teacher? And then like most of them have like one finger up their nose, right? And then half of them are walking like this because they got every book they own or everything, you know what I mean? Or the other are walking like this. <laughs> like they can't even see anything. Half of them are crying. All the girls are excited. All the boys are like, when are we going to get to recess? When do we get a snack? Like... And there's just a thousand things going on. And when I picture what the start of this is, it really is that type of a moment. Because it is the first real instances and moments that are captured in these verses that are 3,000 new basically believers are brought into the fold. And there's 120 believers that are going, what do we do with them? You know, it's like, hey, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. You know, how do we get these people to figure out what it really means to be a follower of Christ? They've accepted this gospel, but how does it change their life? What do we get them to do? And, and Luke does such an amazing job of capturing just in a few verses some of the things that were keys to really understanding what it meant to be a Christian and what they chose to focus on as they started and so what I want to do is I'm going to read through the scripture with you. I just want to read it to you. And I think you're going to see and you're going to start to pull out some of the things that are keys in here when you get such a large chunk of people. What really is important? Because if, you, if you're like me at one of those school assemblies, you know what I'm talking about with those thousand kindergartners or high schoolers, if you get a bunch of people in a room, maybe it's anything you've ever been to. If someone gets up there and starts talking about the things that don't really matter, you get really annoyed really fast. And you want to run really fast. And you don't want to be there anymore. And you start thinking, does this person not realize that that's not really important right now? And I'll tell you, there was an opportunity here to capture what really is most important. Peter has the attention of this crowd. The apostles have the attention of this crowd. They have the hearts of this crowd. They have the momentum going. And what they choose to, to focus on really is going to set the tone for the movement of the church. So I'm going to read that for you, and then I'm going to give you kind of like a blog article. I'm going to give you the five habits from these verses that I think we should focus on ourselves. Whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, I'm going to give you a permission today if you're a non-Christian. These aren't for you. These aren't, these aren't habits for you. These are for followers of Christ. I will tell you this, though. If you try them, even if you're not a Christian, you may find that there's enormous benefits. Enormous benefits. But I will tell you this as a Christian... These are incredibly foundational to the way that you view and follow Christ. Incredibly foundational. So let's look at the scripture together and then we'll walk through those five points. <coughs> so here's the thing. We're starting in chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. Let's, let's uh, have you listen to this as I read it to you. They devoted themselves. Remember, this is right after 3,000 members were added to them. They devoted themselves, these, these 3,120, devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to the, fall, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. And all the believers who were together had everything in common. 
selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were saved. A powerful section of Scripture. Highly encourage you to go back and read over that uh, even after today's message. Even make that something you read once a day just to kind of digest it. But here's what I want to do now. I want to take that passage and I want to kind of give you five things, like I said. But before we jump into that, there's a key thing that I want to make sure that we make this jump together. Because there is a hesitation in my heart to teach rules. Because I am not a rule follower. I have to admit something to you. I'm not. I will never be a legalist. I think. Does that make sense? See, if I say that, then I sound like, oh, God. But as a Christian, especially if you've walked for a number of years, it's really easy for me to give you a list of things to do because it makes us feel better. So I want to make you make sure before we jump into this list that I make the jump with you. Because here's the truth. You and I are sinners. There is nothing we can do that will ever pay for what we have done. We are broken. We are dead. There is nothing we can ever do to repay the debt. But Christ saved us. He loved us enough to come down and rescue. He loved us enough not to come down and just show mercy, but give grace and that He offered Himself to pay for you and for me. That is the foundation of our identity. Paul describes it as this. You are, not, you are no longer condemned to death, but you are now a citizen of heaven. You have eternal purposes. Your citizenship is no longer found here. It is in heaven alone because of that. But there is a war that is waging here between two worlds. A world that leads to death and destruction and a world that leads to eternal life. In Galatians 6, Paul speaks to this specifically. And he says, do not be mocked. Do not deceive yourselves. Because... There's some things you can do in your flesh that you will reap a harvest of destruction. There's some things you can do in Christ that will lead to eternal life. So do not grow weary of doing good. I will tell you this right now. These are not things to do to make you feel better about your position in Christ. These are things to do to give you an abundant, full life in Christ. And that is a big difference. So here's the statement that just shocked my heart. I heard a preacher preach on it this week, and this was what I miss sometimes. The difference, if you're a Christian, between an average life and an abundant life is discipline. The difference sometimes between an average life and an abundant life is your ability and my ability to be disciplined. It, it, it's your ability and my ability to turn to God, to turn away from other things, to reap and to sow in the right place. And I will tell you, as we talk through these five, I want you to do a heart check. This is the start of the church. It's laying it out. Your position, if you have called yourself a believer, if you are a Christian, you are in Christ, you have confessed, you have, you have asked Him to save, you are, you are secure in that. Do not see that as that. But I also want you to say, do I have any doubts about am I living an average life or am I being disciplined enough to reach for abundance? I have to do that to my own life. Some of the things I'm going to share with you today, I'm not perfect at. I'm not the one up here that's standing in here going, I can't say like Paul did a lot where he just said, hey, if you're not sure what to do, just follow me. I, hey, I'm doing my best, but I will tell you to seek after Christ first. Here's the five things. You ready? We're going to start with the first one. It comes from kind of the uh, first verse that we talked about, verse 42, and it says this. Be a learner. Be a learner. One of the most frustrating things for me is I am seeing now how much college and high school is such a valuable tool. And I just squandered it. 
There was such an opportunity to learn in those, in those environments that I was put into. Such an opportunity to learn and to grow. I didn't even paid for half of those. But you miss that opportunity. And then you get to a place where you're just a few years removed from it, and you see all the ways that you're like, man, it would be really nice to like, remember that, what I learned. Because like, I studied it you know, for years, and I can't remember a thing. I will tell you this as a Christian, myself included, it is very easy sometimes to see yourself as arrived, as having enough, as the position to know more is someone else's job. And we talked about it last summer, and I will just tell you this again. Growing people change. Growing people grow. That's what it means. Growing people grow. You have to challenge yourself. I have to challenge myself to be a learner. One of the easiest ways to do this, if you are wanting to grow in your faith, because I know there's lots of times that people will come and they'll say, hey, I just don't feel it anymore. You know, God's just, he's distant. I just feel like I've faded away. You know, like, I just don't feel like he's with me. And sometimes it's a catastrophic event, sometimes some circumstance, but a lot of times it's just everyday life has stuck, you know, just kind of snuck in and stolen the joy. A lot of times it's just the mundane that has stolen this joy. Well, I'll tell you this, I told you this four weeks ago, 10 minutes a day of Scripture will change the rest of your day. If you start your day with 10 minutes of reading your Bible, it will change the rest of your days. If you read the Bible 10 minutes a day for the rest of your days, it will change you. It will change you. It will mold you, and you will be a learner. You will be a learner. One of my favorite things to do is set up systems where you can succeed at being a learner. One of the things that I have right now in my life is I have this thing called an Audible account. How many of you guys just love to read? Like, if you could just shoot your hand up. Just love it. You know, like, you just love it to death. That's amazing. So jealous of you people. <laughs> How many of you, like, if you were chose, like, hey, you got to run through this barbed wire fence or read all these books, you would think twice, maybe even three times, I'm one of those people. I don't say this as an excuse. I don't say this to make you feel sorry for me. But I tell you, reading comprehension is one of the hardest things I have to do. I read so slowly, by the time I get to the end of a sentence, I can't remember the start of it, which makes it really hard to remember the beginning of a paragraph, really, really hard to remember the, the beginning of a page, and extremely difficult to remember the beginning of a chapter when you have dyslexia, like I do at times. And for years, I thought, that's an excuse for me to not to have to read. That's just not who I am. Other people are readers. I'm not a reader. That's just how I treated it. But through this audible.com, I set it up a monthly subscription. Prescription, see? <laughs> it's a prescription for learning. All right? And every month, I download a book. And... I'm not going to lie, I'm like halfway through half of them. But I'm constantly sticking some earphones in when I'm driving somewhere a long ways. Constantly in the morning when I'm too tired to read or frustrated, just sticking an earbud in and letting it play. Because you have an amazing phone, most of you, that will let you do this. Constantly hearing from the people a recommendation of a book and no longer does it bring guilt to me where I'm like, oh, I should read that. I think, no, that's what I'll get next month. Get that book, and I'll read it. Now, I'm not telling you I'm going to, like, MIT next week, and that I'm, like, some genius, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I am telling you that there is something about my soul that loves learning. There's something that's deep inside of me that, that wants to grow and know more. And you notice that I'm not pointing out a specific avenue. I'm not telling you exactly what you need to go and look, but I'm telling you right now, a need to learn is a part of this. And spiritually, your soul needs to be nurtured and grown and challenged. 
be a learner. The first church, the first thing it says in verse 42 is this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. They didn't have the Bibles. They didn't have the audibles, audible accounts. But they had these men in front of them that were willing to teach them. And they devoted themselves to listening. Devoted themselves to listening. The second one is this. Be invested in relationships. Be invested in relationships. And if you're making notes or if you're online uh, or if you're on version, you can type this in. I want you to make and I want you to cultivate. I want you to make and I want you to cultivate. The next two things in verse, uh, verse 42 that it says, it says this. And we're not going to walk all the way through. I'm just showing you what I'm pulling these out of. It says this, they, the fellowship and to breaking of bread. Two types of relationships. One was a fellowship of learning. That takes you making it. You have to be intentional. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know one relationship in my life that if I just let it be would go deeper. You have to be intentional. You have to invest. Some of you have very close relationships that you've had for years and you've never got past the weather or your hobby or your job. You have to make the opportunity happen. You have to make it. It's an investment to go further. To talk about some things that are larger. To talk about some things that go further than the dinner room table. That go further than the car breaking down. You have to make it happen. You have to invest. It is something that you see is worth it, and it is something that you see is something you want. And I, 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 I can't stress that enough. You have to make it. The second thing I said is cultivate. And I'll tell you this right now. That is one of the most difficult things to do. I don't like making new friends. My life is full in my own mind. One of the, one of the craziest things that um, I, I found as I grow up is that my world gets smaller and smaller. And the world around me gets bigger and bigger. My world shrinks because I have certain relationships that I've kept for years, certain things that I've done, certain habits, I drive a certain way, I have a certain job, I talk to certain people, and my world just gets smaller and smaller. Coming out of college, you could go anywhere, do anything. Coming out of high school, you could go anywhere, do anything. But now you're married, now you have kids, now you have a job. It gets smaller and smaller. And the longer you've been in a place, your world probably seems to shrink too. But I'll tell you, there are relationships around us, myself included, that it takes me cultivating, mixing things up a little bit, changing things a little bit, to where the place where I reach out, I develop new relationships. Where I invite someone in, and I love what it says there, breaking of bread. We talked about this in Bless. One of the easiest ways to cultivate a new relationship <coughs> is to invite somebody over for a meal. Invite someone out to lunch. Hang out with someone around food. Because if the, the conversation gets dry or a little awkward, Food's probably still going to be good. If things are a little difficult or not the best, you still got a meal out of it. And it just brings unity. It brings a little bit of, hey, we're doing this together to it. Cultivate. I just want to challenge you to make and cultivate and invest in relationships, as the first church did. Third thing is this be a prayer. Be a prayer. This is probably like one of those things when I say it, you're like, yeah. Especially if you've been around the church for a long time. If you haven't been around the church, or maybe this is your first time to church, you're like, yeah, what is that? Or how do I exactly do that? Because in all the movies, it's just like some guy on his knees in a rainstorm, right? Just crying out, you know? Or it's some little kid sitting next to his bed, right? And that's prayer and most of us don't find ourselves in circumstances 
very often where that's where we're going to be at on a regular basis. Unless, unless we do it intentionally. It's discipline. It's discipline. I challenge you, if you are a follower of Christ, like myself, who's been a follower for 15 years, but you don't have a consistent prayer life, that's not God's fault. If it's, if it's something that you're struggling to find, that discipline, I just want to challenge you to say, the status quo of not having a plan doesn't work. I can take that financially. I can take that all kinds of ways. If you don't have a plan, what do you say to your teenager when they tell you, I don't know what I want to be able to grow up? You need a plan. You know, can't just wander around in life. Got to get a goal and go. You know, you say that, but then we get to a subject like prayer and you're like, hey, let it be, let it be organic. You know, like we'll just pray when we want to, right? We'll just talk to God when we want to. And there is nothing bad with that. In fact, I'm way more comfortable with that because that means I can be lazy whenever I want and I can pray when I need it. Some of the best examples of a prayer life is in Daniel. Daniel chose to pray at specific times every day with his window open and he would get in a specific position which we talk about posture here all the time. Posture matters. Posture matters. And i give you an example of posture, okay? If my wife asks me to do something and I am watching ESPN on the couch like this, and she says, I need you to take out the trash. I'm like, yeah. Uh-huh. This totally looks like it's not true, right? Just believe me for a second. This, is, this could happen. It's a figment. Uh-huh. And then she looks at me and she says, walks in front, you know what I'm saying? Did you hear me? Yeah. I did. I'd love to say that my normal reaction is to stand up or to sit up and to make eye contact and say, I'm on your team, I can do that. There's a difference in posture. If the only time we talk to God is like this, hey God, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, that kind of suck. But it's all good. You know, hey, I could uh, lose a little more money. So and so sick, it'd be good if they got healthy. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like the posture of it, and I'm not trying to overdo it for you, but if your posture is never in a place where you set your eyes on Him, if your posture is never in a place where you remove all other distractions, you know, like one of my pet peeves that I know my friends hate is that I play video games while I watch movies on my phone. Like, I'm not really watching the movie, but I want to play my game, but I want to pretend like I'm social. You know what I'm saying? Some of you are judging me right now. Stop. I could feel that. I felt that. Stop that. All right? But the posture of that is so out of tune with what's happening around me. I'll just challenge you to do this. Find a five minute time a day where you can remove all distractions and create a posture where you can focus on just a conversation with God. And I'll tell you this right now, some of the best prayers I've ever had is when I had nothing to say. And I just need to listen. Five minutes a day, find a place to create an environment, a posture, where you can get alone with God and just ask or listen. Organic is great. I don't want to say that you can't, but just find five minutes in your day. Fourth one is this. Be generous. Be generous. That's one of those statements in there that we read through that very quickly. Like uh, verse 45, like, and they sold their property and possessions and gave it away. Da, 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 go to the next one. Don't want to read that one. It's just so interesting that the first thing that happens is they give their most prized possession to anyone that needed it. I'll tell you, you want to break entitlement and greed in your life? You want to break it? Just break its back? Tithe and be generous. 
We say that all the time from the stage. If you think that I'm trying to manipulate you into getting your money, tied to another church. If you don't believe in what we're doing yet, and you think that I'm trying to manipulate you, I promise you this, tithe to another church and see what God does in your life. On the other half of that, though, for those of you in here that are tithing and are feeling like you can pump your chest out and like what I just said, you just looked around the room in your head and you did one of these, like, yeah, you non-tithers. <laughs> I just want you to remind yourself of this. Greed and entitlement can still sneak into your 90%. Easily. And it is broken through your generosity. There's a great rule that I think is always healthy for you to check your heart. Never own something that you would not lend to someone if they really needed it. Never own something that you would not lend to someone if they really needed it. It's a great way to check your heart, and I know there's some responsibility there, and you need to be a good owner of what God has given to you, but I'll just tell you, if you're using that as an excuse to not be generous, careful. Careful. God is rich in love. He does not just give barely enough. He gives abundantly more than enough. We are called to be in His image. Be generous. Be generous. And the last one is this. Be a worshiper. Be a worshiper. This passage ends with such a cool section where they said, they meet together in homes, they ate together they, with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. I will tell you, pessimism, 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 I cannot even say that word. Being a pessimist is dominant in our culture right now, and it defeats the heart of worship if you allow it. It defeats the heart of worship if you allow negative things to take over your life, whether it's political, financial, sports, whether it's you know an auto repair, whether it's your home, whether it's your kids, whatever it is, if you allow that to steal your joy, you're allowing the devil to steal your worship. See, worship is not just singing from the stage. Worship is a glad and sincere heart, no matter what you're doing. Worship is a glad and sincere heart for what God has done. It is a deeper understanding of the gospel, and it is worshiping God in response to that. I truly believe... I'm not saying you need to be listening to Caleb all over the place or have your radio tuned to that. And every time you walk through the door, it just starts up. Every time you're going somewhere, you're whistling a worship song. You know, I'm not trying to give you those, but I am telling you this. If you are not worshiping God outside of this room in some way, whether it through words or posture, you're missing the point of the gospel. You're missing it. God is bigger than Sunday mornings. God's gospel is bigger than Sunday mornings. And I love watching, uh, I didn't even tell Kevin I was going to do this, but I, I'll embarrass him, so he'll love it. But Kevin, of course, leads worship on here, and I just love how it's affected his son Jude's heart. Um, he can get a guitar out and start playing, and Jude will worship with him, will sing with him. And he's not two years old. And I just think it's crazy how you watch that transfer from a father's heart onto a son's heart. And just, boom, right there. And I'll tell you, you are doing the same thing to the people around you. Because the very next verse that it says in here is that God added to their numbers daily. When you worship God in your daily life, God moves in the people around you because it flows out of you. It absolutely flows out of you. Your glad and sincere heart in the McDonald's line, remember what I'm working on? As well as through your job, through your family, through your daily job or work or routine, God needs to be worshipped. Living on mission is being a worshiper at its core. 
So here's what I want to give you as kind of a final thought for these, because I, I truly believe most of you, if you took one of these and you just worked on them, that'd be a great thing for you to do. Some of you may try to tackle two or three. Good luck, all right? But I really hope that you'll at least take one and you'll start it. But I want to give you a little bit of encouragement before you go out, because most of you in here, if you're Christians, you have a little story that goes something like this. I tried that, and it didn't work. You know, I did that, and it didn't work. You know, I, 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 I may have attempted that. Maybe you're not even a Christian in here, and that's your story. You're like, no, 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 I did that. It didn't work. Or here's what I want to tell you. Discipline says this. There is a big difference between trying and training. There is a big difference between trying and training. And that sermon that I heard this week that spoke to my heart, this was the thing that he shared at the end. He said obesity is one of the biggest problems in America. It's one of the things that causes the most death. It's one of the things that causes the most amount of debt in our country. It's some of the, the causes and the, and the needs that come out of obesity. And so he said, here's, here's what I want you to think about. He said, what if we all got together and we tried to run a marathon right after church? We all just they said, we're going to draw a line and then we're going to run 26.2 miles. And I got you guys all rallied up and you were all excited and you were like, we're going to do this! And then like, for me, like 0.2 miles. I'm like convulsing, you know, you're dragging me. Like four people finish, all right? Kevin's ahead of the pack, all right? I want, I'm throwing stones at him as he's passing. And Lauren, nine months pregnant, is right behind him, all right? <laughs> And I'll just tell you, that's trying. But if we all train for six months, nine months, we did things intentionally, we worked hard on something, the majority of us in here, if we really gave our heart and soul to it, we could do it. It may not be the most enjoyable thing, it may not be the thing that we want or at the end, but you know what? You can train your body to do it. Paul himself says the body is good to physically train, but the soul, the spirit, is so much more valuable. The sense of accomplishment that you would get from running a marathon is nothing compared to what God could train you to do if you would just put some discipline into your spirit, into your life. He would take you from average to abundance. He would take you from barely hanging on to living the full life. And it would all be through training you to be disciplined. Through helping you to be disciplined. I challenge you, as the first century church did, to devote yourselves to these things. Devote yourselves to these things. Be a learner. Absolutely. Be a learner. Challenge yourself. Do not let this go by where you just say, that's not who I am. Invest in relationships. It's not all task-oriented. Absolutely be, be in prayer. Constantly be in prayer. See opportunities to be generous, not as moments where things are taken from you, but opportunities to give in response of what you've been given. And the last one, worship God with everything you have. <coughs> everything you have. Let me pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. We treasure you. Lord, as we, uh, we read these passages and we see the way the Lord, the church started and the way that, Lord, you just guided, taught them, trained them. Lord, you used the apostles that had spent time with Jesus to hands-on experience with you to just mold this church. Lord, may we allow the same thing to happen here. Your Spirit would just come in and allow us to be disciplined, to train us. Lord, not because we need to, not because it's a response not as something that we can gain or we want, but Lord, because we see it as the true citizenship that we hold. We see it as this is who you've called us to be. This is who our identity is in. It's not of this world, it's of these things. And though this world fights against us and it is difficult, Lord, may we see it as an opportunity right now to declare ourselves citizens of heaven, to fight, to run the race, as Paul says, towards you. Lord, we love you. It's your name that we pray. Amen.
I know for some of you in here, uh, it may have been your first Sunday or you haven't been to church in a long time, or maybe uh, this type of stuff just scares you. You're like, I don't want to do rules. Well, I'll just tell you, this is the type of stuff that flows out of what God does in your life. Because when God gets a hold of your life, when Jesus comes into your life, these are the types of things, they don't look like burdens anymore. They look like incredible gifts that we would just merely take hold of. Incredible opportunities to talk to our saviors, to give to those around us who invest in this beautiful creation, to learn of this expansive universe and the God that created it, to worship the one that deserves the worship. These are not things or burdens. These are things that are gifts, that are beautiful parts of our relationship with God. And I'll just encourage you, wherever you're at, that is an offer that's extended to you, to experience this God, to be a part of a life that is not average, but is abundant, that is, a, that is beyond, that is full. And I extend that to you and say, if you would like to pray with someone today, if you'd like to ask some questions about what that would look like for you to walk in that, we'd love to pray with you up front or in the back. And some of you in here, these these things, if you're following Christ, they hit you between the eyes and you just want some prayer, conviction. God's going to help train you to be a better dad, to be a better husband through these things. That It's going to start at the core of your soul, but it's going to flow into the extension of your life. And you want to see God right now start something. We would love to pray with you up front and back. And of course, while this is going on, we respond to God as the first century church did by breaking bread and taking communion together. We take this little piece of crumbly cracker and we say, this symbolizes Jesus' body that was broken for us. We take this little piece or little cup of juice and we say, this is the blood that was shed for me that covered my sins, that captured my heart, that has rescued me, made me clean. And we give it all the glory to Christ and we surrender our lives and then we say, whatever you should have us do, we do. So this morning, let's respond together. If you need prayer, please come forward. If not, let's respond and take communion together. this morning. Praise for your faithfulness and your unfailing, unconditional love uh, for us. Lord, would you continue to teach us what it means to be your church? Lord, what it means uh, to Lord, to not just survive this life, but become fully alive in you, the life that you have saved us for, you have called us to. Lord, continue to teach. Lord, allow us to continue to listen as you speak and go out from this place. Lord, in this time, uh, we continue to worship you and worship you alone as we give you our offerings. So Lord, as, as we give you what's already yours, uh, Lord, as you continually seek to be the only God in our life, uh, Lord, we give, allow us to teach us what it means to give with a, a cheerful heart, Lord, what it means to worship through the way that we give to you, Lord, that we are generous. And we give all this to you, Lord, and we bless it for your kingdom, for your glory, in your name we pray. Amen. Awesome. I wanted to just say a special thank you. I have to just tell you guys, the camps that we have going on, Maranatha, our youth stuff that's going on, incredible things that are being done through our student ministries and through our children's ministries. And just want to continue to say thank you for those that are giving. Uh, just an amazing opportunity is provided and, and help be provided uh, through what you do and uh, how you give. So thank you so much. Uh, 
uh, for doing that and being a part of that. We do have a pool party for the 7th through 12th graders that is happening this Tuesday at 5 o'clock. All right. And it is at Shelly Owens' house, or Shelly and Steve Owens' house. I have the uh, address and the directions already up on the Clash page. So if you go to Kingsways and you look for our student ministry page, you'll find it. It's up right there with the time. If you have any questions, my number is on there, so you can call and get any of that information. Uh, also, summer camps going on this week. Uh, fifth and sixth grade actually takes off today. Uh, they will be leaving uh, the church through sixth grade at 2 30 and uh, returning on Wednesday at 2.30. So, 5th and 6th graders are leaving today at 2.30, and we're getting back on 2.30 on Wednesday. And then 2nd uh, through 4th grade, they have a camp as well as the evening on Thursday. They're going to be taking off at 9.30 a.m. and returning on Saturday at 2.30 p.m. If you have any questions, uh, you can feel free to come talk to us right afterwards. John will be around. And, uh, but also feel free to email or call or Facebook us throughout the week. Um, at, to when your kids are coming over, if they can stay there forever. <laughs> so. Pray for John. He's going to have those two camps this week, so he'll get all that. Crazy. At our uh, high school camp, 10th through 12th grade, we leave next Sunday at 1 p.m. Uh, if you're a child or a student, I should say, not child, although your parents probably still see you as a little baby. Uh, if you're leaving next Sunday at 1, so if we still have spots. I think we have two or three spots still available. So if you're if you're in that boat, we're undecided, or maybe you'd like to come, we would love to have you. Uh, those spots uh, comes with uh, opportunities too, as well for partial or full scholarships. But those need to have conversations to make that happen. But we do have a couple spots still available for that camp leaving next Sunday at one o'clock. I uh, also want to let you know that coming up in August, August is our family month uh, this year. We actually did this for the first time last year, and it was actually in May, but we changed it to August this year. So I want to let you know that we have some awesome events uh, planned as we just celebrate families. I want to have some awesome opportunities for families just to hang out, make some family memories, and have some fun, uh, both as a family as well as a church family. The first thing that's coming up is August 2nd. Uh, we're going to a Springfield Cardinals game. So we're just selling tickets in the back of the leader at the Connections booth. And you can go back there. Tickets are $7. It's, uh, the game starts, I believe, at 6, 10 p.m. that night. Uh, and uh, $7, I think three and under are free. So we're just kind of... for the grass, right? It's for yeah, the we're going to be in the, in, the, in the grass area. Uh, awesome, awesome place just to hang out, especially with other people. If you have kids, it's wonderful because they can run around and roll around. And, and you just let them go. Yeah. So look. So... <laughs> Um, so uh, feel free, that's coming up in just a couple weeks. It's kind of snuck up on all of us, I'm sure. And so if you go back to the Connections booth, Danny and Leanne would love to sign you up for some Springfield Cardinals tickets as the church heads out there. Our Sunday meal for today is chicken enchiladas, corn, Caesar salad, and dessert. If you are brand new to Kingsway, we'd love to offer this as a free gift for you to stay and eat with us. Uh, get connected. Uh, if you're not new to Kingsway, it's four dollars a person or twelve dollars for a whole family. Also, uh, one special announcement we want to just put at the very end is you guys, if you choose to stay for the meal or not, uh, there is a very special lady in our congregation who celebrated a birthday this last week. And in the back uh, of the worship center <laughs> here, we have some cakes. Um, and actually a chair that Beulah Hunter is going to be sitting back in. And, uh, she turned like, 25, right? 25. 25. She looks good. Too. <laughs> and so just want to encourage you. She's going to be sitting right back there. I think they're going to take some pictures before we cut into the cake. But I uh, would love for you just to stop by and say hey real fast to her. Wish her a happy birthday. As well as if you're staying for the meal or not and you want to grab a piece of cake, encourage you to stay and eat some cake. So... You have them here too. Awesome. Hey, you guys have a great glorious day in the Lord. We'll see you later.